Again, welcome. I'm going to keep saying that. Uh, my name is Mary Alexander. I'm the Curator of Education and Public Engagement at the Arkell Museum and Canna Johari Library. We are located in beautiful Canna Johari, New York. Um, we are a stone's throw or a, actually about, you know, a throughway away from um, the Mohawk River. So it's definitely central to our lives here in Canna Johari and our museum's life. We're always concerned and care about what is the river doing right now? Um, very central and important to us. So uh, thank you all again for joining us, for dealing with that little issue with the link. Um, we're gonna have a great time tonight. I'm sharing with you um, a small PowerPoint. I'm gonna talk briefly. I'll try to talk briefly. And then Sarah's going to share her screen and talk a little bit about what she does. Um, a little bit about me, I am, from Arizona, which is very exciting. And I've been up here around 10 years. Uh, I've been at the museum here at the Arkell for about three, uh, coming up on that anniversary. So I love art and history and being able to connect it to just about anything. So the chance to connect it to the environment is very important um, because so many of our pieces are landscapes and protecting those landscapes is essential to future art as well. So welcome everyone. Uh, thank you again. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Oh, I have these nice pictures to show you while I was introducing it. That's us. Um, we're the Arkell and we are also a public library. A uh, very unusual mix, um, but really great fun to have um, kids uh, exploring books and literature. Uh, and we like to say it's where art or where pictures and words meet is here at the Arkell. We open on March 5th. Uh, we will have online programming uh, in February and March as well, the rest of the year, uh, but stay tuned for that. If you don't follow us on social media, you should, because it's fabulous. I am the one that does it, so I'm a little partial, um, but I like to show beautiful pictures of um, from the collection and around our area, and I share local events and things like that, so we'd love to have you follow us along. So today the conversation is the noses. That's why everyone's here. Um, and the noses are a wonderful spot um, on the Mohawk River. And Sarah can give you all the right words for what it is. Um, but it's basically where two um, hill mountain type things come close together. Um, I drive through the noses every single day. It's my favorite part of my journey. And I always look for bald eagles that like to hang out in that area. So I know that it's a fun, uh, a fun and important spot, a landmark for sure. Um, so I'm talking about the art of um, the noses. We have two pieces that directly have the noses in them. Uh, this one is Deborah Gertzi's The Noses. It is a recent painting from the last few years. Deb Gertzi is a living artist. Um, she had a she had a show here a few years ago and a patron of ours um, wanted to donate a piece of her art, felt it was very important to be part of the collection. Uh, and we of course agreed. We love when people wanna donate wonderful paintings like this to us. Um, and this one, sorry, is a little fuzzy of an image. I had to use a cell phone shot. It's getting professionally photographed in February. Uh, but Gertzi is uh, a, etching, etchers, uh, printmaker by trade. Um, and she's very successful uh, out of Gloucester for many years. She recently moved to the Adirondacks and has expanded into um, oil painting. And this is one of her oils. So we're very excited to have it. Uh, it actually shows the noses if we're standing um, on the Arkell mm -hmm. side of the river, that would be the south side of the river, and looking eastward. Mm -hmm. I know my directions. And um, you can actually see just how she really captures um, the rocky um, kind of face of the noses and but also the abundance of greenery that's there. And I think that's one of the special things about um, about the noses is that there is that mix of um, both the actual rocks and the uh, 
the greenery, you don't necessarily see that here on the East Coast as much as more of the West Coast um, Rockies kind of thing. So she does a great job capturing it here. You can also see that she's um, included part of the built environment. Um, there's a little bit on the right side where it looks, she didn't put the throughway in, but there's definitely some sort of a road there at the bottom of the painting. And um, on the left side in the back of the painting, you can see there's some um, rectangles. And uh, that's the word I was looking for. Um, and that's basically the train that runs on that side of the valley. So he has included this part of the environment. Um, to me, having moved from afar here to the Mohawk Valley, one thing that has always struck me about the history, about the art of the Mohawk Valley is that it has seemed like a working river. Um, it is employed in many different respects. Its borders or its banks are employed in work. Um, and that's something that environmentally you have to kind of consider impacts of like the railway that we see here, um, the throughway that's on the other side, and then of course the roads that run along both the throughway and the uh, train tracks. My last painting is really what inspired Sarah to contact me um, about this program and is really exciting. Um, this is William Coventry Walls. Um, New York and the Erie Canal. Now, the Arkell Museum holds a vast amount of Erie Canal art, um, Mohawk Valley art, was something that our founder, Bartlett Arkell, was very passionate about collecting, uh, pieces that look like the place around here. Um, he wanted to show people of Canada Johari and the region how beautiful um, their region is and to be proud of it. So he was collecting pieces, he was commissioning pieces that showed the beauty of the region. And this is um, from 1862, William Coventry Wall was an artist um, who immigrated about 10 years old from England with his family. And he actually is from the Pittsburgh area. He owned a small art studio, sold um, portraits or paintings and um, what do you call it? art supplies, um, frames, things like that. Um, and then in Pittsburgh, there was a very large, very destructive fire. Um, we all know the Chicago fire, but there was something similar that happened uh, in Pittsburgh in the 1800s. And it destroyed not only his studio, uh, but something like half the city. Um, he painted several paintings of this fire and he's most well known for those paintings, but he was a successful guy. He's not the most famous artist, but he was definitely known, purchased, he was a working artist um, and saw success in his lifetime and is remembered now for these kind of pastoral images. And that's something to say um, about this piece is that it is absolutely full of nostalgia. You think, oh, this is perfect. It's exactly what the Erie Canal looked like in 1862. And I really believe Wall was painting from his imagination a little bit. Um, it's a great painting because to me, I came from Arizona and I was like, wait, 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 where's the Erie Canal? Um, and this is great because it shows us where the Erie Canal was. It wasn't connected to the Mohawk River. It was a little bit further away, right where 5S um, actually is right now. And uh, the boats would travel, um, excuse me, for that pinging. Um, the uh, boats would actually travel um, and be pulled upstream via um, horse or mule and would of course go downstream similarly or with just the movement of the water. Um, he's definitely given us a look at the noses that is idyllic. Um, odds are they're the same towns that are right there now were there in the 60s, 1860s. So he has kind of taken away that built environment um, a little bit for us and has given us a more pastoral look at um, the noses and at the Erie Canal itself. Uh, this gives it this vibe of very um, beautiful and calm and not the working river that it really was at the time. Um, I love this just like leisurely, <laughs> like 
rowboat looking thing uh, in the Erie Canal there, um, not actually showing um, all of the workings of the actual canal, though we have many paintings that do. Um, that is one plug, uh, the 2023 and beyond, there are many anniversaries for the canal and we will be putting out a lot of our canal art. Um, this piece is always out because we have blown it up into a wall mural. So it's a wall, wall mural. Um, the original is very small. It's like eight and a half by 11. I, I saw it and I was like, wait, that little thing is that? Um, but this piece is great. It's large and on the wall and you can come see it anytime, even when we're closed. Um, so I am going to hand it off to Sarah and she, oh, I have a bio for her and I'm gonna read it. Sarah's the associate director. I'm sorry for the pinging. I can't turn it off. My apologies. Sarah's the associate director for MHLC, responsible for oversight of land systems and assisting with property acquisitions. Sarah brings nearly 10 years experience in habitat restoration initiatives for bird habitat, riparian and wetland areas, as well as experience in protecting of conservation lands, nonprofit program development and trail planning. Oh, you do a lot. Uh, she received her bachelor's in wildlife science, that's cool, from SUNY um, ESF and her master's degree in science education from University of Albany in 2012. She's an avid, avid outdoor enthusiast who enjoys backcountry skiing, mountain biking, hiking, paddling, sailing, and bird watching. Awesome. I'm handing it over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mary, and thanks for being willing to partner on this because um, as you can tell by those paintings that you showed, the convergence of art and nature are just part of our history as humans on the earth. So I'm gonna take you from the artistic side into the scientific side a little bit and try to mesh those worlds for all of us um, and talk to you a little bit about what we're um, hoping to accomplish this evening. So I did a quick little outline just to give you an idea and a flavor of our journey together this evening. Um, I'm going to give you an overview of MHLC or Mohawk Hudson Land Conservancy, who we are and what we do. I do see some familiar faces or names, I should say, um, who have attended. So some of you already know who we are. Some of you I'm sure are new to us as well. And then I'm going to give you an overview of our connectivity work with the Nature Conservancy. We've been working on this idea of connecting the Catskills to the Adirondacks through a connected corridor of protected land. So we'll talk about how that came to be, um, the challenges of making that large landscape connected. We're gonna build a case for conservation to address these, these challenges. And then I'm gonna show you some of the work that the Nature Conservancy has been doing on the ground. Um, this is the really fun stuff that uh, you'll get to see, which I'm excited about. So first, who is Mohawk Hudson Land Conservancy? We are your local land trust. So we've been preserving and stewarding the lands of the Mohawk and the Hudson River since 1992. We've protected approximately 12,500 acres. And we work in the traditional lands of the Mohawk and the Mohican peoples. Our service area covers Albany, Schenectady, and Montgomery counties. And there are a bunch of different ways that we protect land. We work with willing landowners um, who sometimes donate lands to us. Um, sometimes we purchase those lands. We're looking at the Bozenkill Preserve in the background right now, which is actually um, in Altamont, New York, and is a combination of donated and purchased lands. Um, the, the items that we own, we usually open to the public. So we do have preserves, and I'll touch on that in just a second, that, um, allow public access for skiing, snowshoeing, dog walking, those kinds of things. And then we also work with private landowners to do conservation easements. And so conservation easements um, are working with landowners to extinguish those development rights and limit development and subdivisions um, to ensure that the property stays largely protected and we're protecting natural resources for the long term. Um, the landowner still pays the taxes and, and still has ownership of the property. They've just gotten rid of those or um, reduced the development um, potential there. So we have 22 different ways to get outside in the three counties that we serve. 
This is again, a beautiful picture of the Bosenkill. I might be a little bit biased because I am zooming in from Altamont, um, Bosenkill's right down the road. Um, when you come to any of our 22 preserves, you're welcomed by a kiosk, parking area. Um, the kiosks have information about the history of how we acquired the property through either a gift or a purchase. And then um, there's always trail uh, maps and markers to make sure that you find your way. We also have this great map app that's totally free for your phone and it helps guide you along the trail system so you know exactly where you are on the ground. This is a great tool for those who might be new to hiking and I encourage you to visit our website, which I'll show you at the end of the presentation um, to grab that map. So today I'm gonna to talk about the Mohawk watershed um, and how this is a pathway to the Catskills to the, from the Catskills to the Adirondacks. Um, we're working with the Nature Conservancy through a grant through DEC's Mohawk Watershed Program to create a connectivity plan. And these are the steps that we're taking, um, and I'm going to bring you for an inside look on these steps in this presentation. But essentially, we're bringing together partners and community members by giving presentations like this, um, reaching out to local municipalities. We're completing some field work. Um, to do some assessments. Then we're going to analyze those findings and create this vision of the Catskills to the Adirondacks, all the while creating a connectivity plan within our communities to help wildlife. So that sounds pretty complicated, but I'm gonna break it down. <clears throat> Starting with what is Catskill to Adirondack? And so very simply, um, it's a landscape scale conservation and connectivity plan. How the Catskills to Adirondack came to be was through this larger initiative called the Staying Connected Initiative. This is um, groups like land trusts, municipalities, other planning associations across um, what they call basically the Blue Ridge to the Boreal. So Southern, South of Virginia, all the way up the East Coast and then North to Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. Um, all these organizations that work on conservation and protection coming together and working to make the landscape connected. As um, they took a look at the landscape, they said, oh, look, there's these interesting connectivity pieces or resilient areas or forested blocks that actually connect the Adirondacks, that's this blue bit that you see here, to the Catskills to the south. And interestingly, our service area, Albany, Schenectady, and Montgomery counties fall right in this purple blob. So they created this linkage and we became a member of the Staying Connected Initiative. This is a zoom out of the map showing other linkages that the Nature Conservancy and Staying Connected Initiative have developed in New York State to give you a flavor for some of the other areas that are really important to connectivity. So you can see this is the linkage we're talking about in this map, it's called Mohawk, but essentially it's Catskill to Adirondack. There's also the Tug Hill region to Adirondack. There's Algonquin Park in Ontario to Adirondack, and then Adirondack to Greens, the Kittatinny Range, and the Berkshires to the Hudson Highlands, all highlighted in purple. So these are all different partners all across the state working towards these goals of connecting the landscape for wildlife. Now, if we zoom out even further, um, we're able to see this is the entire, uh, um, sorry, the northern apps up here to connecting to the central apps through this big flow zone of what they call resilient and connected lands. And the red star here is showing you the capital region um, located between the Catskills here and the Adirondacks to the north. So there's one other way that we can illustrate this. Um, and I can show that to you here, hopefully. Let's see if we can. Okay, can you guys see that? It's something that we recently got from the Nature Conservancy is showing migration in motion. And for me, it's a great illustration when we talk about climate change, what is going to happen? And so as the climate change happens, um, it's gonna alter habitats and disrupt ecosystems. Where will the animals move to survive? And will human development prevent them from getting there? And um, it says here on the left, this map shows the average direction of mammals, birds, and amphibians, and how they're going to need to move to track hospitable climates as they shift across the landscape. And if we look at New York State, which is right here, it's hard because this is flowing so much, but essentially it's really going right through that capital region 
where we all live, making our backyards and our homes incredibly important. I'm just going to pause for a second, let that flow through your mind and watch um, how interesting this is. Um, and I'm going to gracefully shift back to my slides. So if you zoom into our capital region in Albany, Schenectady, and Montgomery counties, you can see how close this blue line is. Now, this is the Catskill um, Park here in the south is a light blue line. And then this is the Adirondack Park in the north. And you can see how those three counties are really situated so nicely between these two counties. The Nature Conservancy, and I know I keep referring to them, but they're a global um, conservation organization. They have lots of resources, lots of scientists who have been studying climate and climate change, and have luckily for us produced all kinds of great resources to help guide our work. This is their resili resilient and connected mapping. Um, and so this image actually shows the science of, of our region. And so you can see that there are areas with climate flow zones, meaning that these have great areas where animals can move. There's a lot of connected forests. There's all kinds of habitat to support them. You can see there's also vulnerable areas. And these tend to be in areas where there's high population. So there's lots of development happening or has happened. Albany, Schenectady, around Amsterdam, Saratoga Springs, Bennington, Vermont. These are all vulnerable areas because they are most likely to be developed or have already been developed. There's also climate corridors. These are, again, great areas for animals to travel. And then um, there's resilient areas with confirmed diversity. When we talk about resilience, you just, um, resilience, when I think about it, it's simply something that can bounce back from a change. So when you um, have something like a pandemic, you wanna make sure that you have lots of diversity because then you're ensuring that there are some organisms that will survive um, that. And it's the same thing with climate change. You wanna make sure there's lots of diverse habitats in order um, so that there's some left after there's a major change like climate change. And so these areas of resiliency, um, particularly like this minty green, you can see how it's kind of scattered here. Um, the minty green, the purples, the um, burgundies, those are sort of the great pathways for animals to follow. And so the Nature Conservancy is looking at these and then drawing on the ground, how are these all connected? How can we help wildlife move like that flow map that I showed you? So when they took a look at our capital region, they really highlighted two particular areas that had great resiliency for that north-south corridor to connect the Catskills to the Adirondacks. The first one is over here um, in the east. This is the Glenville Hill Rotterdam area. And then the other one is right here near the Arkell Museum uh, in Spraker's Canajahari area. Um, and I will say that one of the things that is key with resilience is changes in topography. So when you think about that Glenville Hill has lots of topography, meaning different changes in elevation, and so do the noses, which make it spike on the map. So what are the challenges if we're trying to connect to this larger landscape? I wanna thank the Arkell Museum and Mary in particular for allowing us to use this image. You've already seen it this evening and you got the history of the painter. Um, again, this is um, the New York and Erie Canal circa 1862, maybe not exactly what it looks like, um, but you can see that there's not a lot of human activity that is impeding on the ability for wildlife to move across the landscape. If you put on your black bear suit and decided to go for a walk, you would have to swim across the Erie Canal and maybe the Mohawk, but otherwise there's not much impeding. You know, you could probably hop this fence. There's not much else in the way of, of you moving through this landscape. Now, if you take a look at a very similar vantage of what it looks like today, thanks to lowridgeproductions.com, you can see that it's changed a lot and there's a lot of influence from humans on the landscape. This is the throughway here. Of course, the Mohawk River is here. This is a railway and then this is 5S. And those um, rectangles that Mary had noted in the first painting we looked at were acknowledging the railroad that is here. So if you were thinking about being a black bear and crossing this, um, moving traffic, large trucks, it's a much scarier predicament than it used to be and very dangerous. 
So if you're not crossing the road, what are your alternatives? Um, right now, we're taking a look at these crossings to reduce animal collisions, um, but also to ensure that this north-south movement of animals can actually happen as the climate shifts. If it can't, we'll have a really huge problem keeping our diversity and these important species on the landscape. So culverts, bridges, any sort of underpass is a great way to get wildlife across a particular area. These are just some examples of what you might face if you were crossing the landscape. You can see how some of these, like this road, probably not that bad to walk across. But if you didn't want to get your feet wet, you didn't want to get into a tight space like this, you probably wouldn't want to cross there. When we're talking about wildlife crossings, what exactly are we talking about? We're of course talking about any animals, but generally the bigger ones have the harder problem moving across the landscape and often give the most damage to traffic, um, to drivers, and are most dangerous when they're hit. We're looking at bobcat, we're looking at black bear, fisher, and also white-tailed deer. Um, these first three have large home ranges. They need gene flow. They need to disperse to other areas and find mates they're not related to. White-tailed deer are just large and can cause all kinds of problems for vehicular traffic. Um, and it is important for them to still be able to safely move across the landscape. It doesn't mean we love them less. It's just that these guys are a little more rare on the landscape. Um, just so you know, these bobcats were actually featured in the Times Union a couple of years ago. They were local to Albany County, and this fisher was actually taken um, near the Bows and Kill Preserve in Altamont. So there are some, some local folks here. So we've seen the challenges. It's really those crossings that are intersecting that north-south corridor. Um, and how do we address these challenges of connecting the land for these wildlife? Well, there's actually a North Atlantic Aquatic Connectivity Collaborative. And don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to recite that back to me at the end of this presentation. Um, but this particular group came together and worked on culverts and assessments for anadromous and catadromous fishes. So this is basically fish that go back to their natal grounds and they spawn. And so how do we make sure they get there? I'm sure you've heard about dams. Now dam removals are a big deal to try to ensure that these fish can get to their native spawning grounds. Um, and so they created a protocol where people actually go out and look at these um, in different culverts and crossings so that the fish aquatically in the water can move to where they need to go. In more recent years, as we've seen the impact of roads and other human-made um, infrastructure reduce mammal populations, they actually altered this to create a protocol, not just for fish, but to also include uh, mammals like black bear, bobcat, and fisher. So the Nature Conservancy is working in partnership with us under this grant to assess bridges and culverts using this protocol. And so these are the two field technicians that were out. Um, that's actually right below, you can see the truck there, that's below uh, the throughway. They're measuring this bridge um, to determine, you know, does it need any alteration to be able to allow for wildlife crossings to happen more safely? And again, they're assessing for the aquatic life that swim, but also our terrestrial or walking mammals that would also use these as passageways. These are some great examples of ways that upgrades can happen to some of these um, particular culverts and bridges to improve it for wildlife crossing. So we may not have to tear up the road and put in a whole new culvert. We could retrofit some of these things to make it easier for wildlife to make these crossings safely. In your top left, this is a critter shelf. Um, I love the name. I'll show it to you um, in use here in a little bit. Um, but essentially, this is great for raccoons skunks, um, you know, fisher, anybody that is a little bit smaller woodchuck um, who may not be able to or want to swim in deep water um, to get through here. Rip wrap and placing these big boulders on the side so there's some type of dry passage is also another way to improve the pass passage through a large culvert like this. You can see here that the this deer is walking under here 
the recommendation would be to actually flatten this a little bit to make a more obvious pathway so that they're more likely to take this route. And then down here in the bottom right, this is a dream scenario. Out west, there are many more um, migratory species like, um, you know, pronghorn, elk, and those kinds of things. Um, in Banff, the Banff area um, up in uh, Canada, in the western side of the country, they've created these wildlife overpasses. Um, and the interesting thing is they've studied grizzly bears in that area, and a, a female grizzly will not go under one of these with her cubs, she would rather take an overpass. And which makes sense. I mean, if you had your kids and you were you had to go down this dark underground tunnel with them, or you could choose this really nice open air crossing above, you probably choose the same thing. And so we're learning a lot about what wildlife needs. Um, wildlife overpasses may not be what we use currently in the east, but if we see a huge migration due to climate change, it could be our future. So this is the my favorite part of the presentation where I share with you some of the results of the game cameras that were installed at some of these um, culvert and bridge underpasses so that you can get a sense of who is using these areas. Um, these were taken just, this is just August 1st of this past summer and you can see that this is a little fawn, it's still got its spots. Um, it's not just about the mammals. This is a great blue heron. Uh, there's another image we have of it standing on the cement pylon fishing, um, which was really neat. But it actually flew under the bridge, which was interesting. I hope it made it okay. This is actually the back of a fisher's head. So there's an ear there and there. There's its back, and there's its tail. So again, Fisher is one of those animals that has a lot, big home range, lots of movement. We wanna make sure they're dispersing so that they have good gene flow. This is a very uh, bold um, Fisher. You can see again, here are the two ears and it's carrying something in its mouth, very distinct white stripe down the back. It's carrying a skunk that it killed for dinner. So <laughs> love that picture. This is the, what I call the first day of school photo. So this is the two eyes of an otter standing looking at the camera, almost like its mom is forcing it to look at the camera and say, it's your first day of school, we're taking a photo. I love this one. Uh, this is a little family of raccoons. So this is the adults. These are the little babies. You can see their little ringed tails and they're learning how to fish here. This is that same uh, vantage that we saw the great blue heron um, during the day, but at night you can see that this is where the raccoons come um, to get their feet wet and, and grab some crayfish. So this was not one of our images. This is one that we borrowed, but you can see here um, how these little bandits love to use a critter shelf. In this case, they obviously like to get their feet wet too, um, but when it came to doing a crossing, um, this is, a critter shelf in use. So these are some of the retrofits that we're looking at. So before I head into why it's important, so the data has been collected and we're crunching it right now. We're going to be doing a big mapping effort to take a look at the corridor um, and where the conservation importance is, is. And then also looking at those two pinch points of Glenville Hill and Sprakers to be able to provide upgrades and improvements to the underpasses for wildlife to be able to move through the, the um, corridor more safely. So I'm just gonna check the time. It's just a little bit after seven. So I will wrap up by 7.30 at the very latest. I just have a little bit more left. So if you hang with me, that would be great. I wanna talk a little bit about why the Catskill to Adirondack vision is so important and why making the case for a conservation corridor um, and the work that we're doing really matters. So when you see the sign um, entering the Adirondack Park and you see it some, for some people, if you see this shape, you know what that means. The Adirondacks are a really important place. Um, we've been taught as New Yorkers that, you know, the Adirondacks are incredibly special and they are. Um, it's one of the greatest rewildings we've ever seen um, in conservation and it is truly a special place. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature has a definition. So. We have a feeling when we look at this sign, but it actually is this protected area that's clearly defined geographical space. 
It's recognized, dedicated, managed. There's legal or other effective means means to achieve the long-term conservation. And the conservation is associated with ecosystem services and cultural values. So that's really what this means. Um, and so once we defined this area, we all stood behind it and we said, we're gonna keep this a special place. This is another example um, of a conservation initiative in the West. So this is Yellowstone to Yukon. You can see these a grizzly bear is there. Um, the pillar of their work. They're actually working on, um, for over 20 years, they've been working from down here by Yellowstone all the way up into the Yukon Territory of Canada um, to make a connected landscape, particularly for grizzly bears. The bears that live in Yellowstone National Park are ge um, ge sorry, genetically and geographically um, cut off from the other grizzly bears that exist in this entire region. And so they're finding this gene pool is getting really, 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 really close. So, which is not good because if something comes and infects them and they get sick, they're less likely to be resilient and overcome it. So over 20 years, they've been working with across this entire region to uh, work on connectivity for grizzly bears and other animals too. But the latest success was in Washington County this past year, they had the first radio collared female with two of her babies. Um, in Washington state for the first time in decades as a result of this connectivity work. And again, it's all of these partners working together and saying, we want Yellowstone to Yukon for these reasons. And that's made these successes happen. Here's one a little more local. This is um, Algonquin to Adirondack Collaborative, connecting the Adirondack Park up across the Thousand Islands to Algonquin Park in Ontario. Um, the story they use is Alice the Moose, who was radio collared in Newcomb, female cow, um, moose. She walked to this um, dotted line across through the Thousand Islands, and now they're actually creating this red line, which is the A to A trail that people can actually walk um, to illustrate the important migratory path that animals take between these two larger conservation areas. And this is what we're emulating with our Catskill to Adirondacks. When we can get behind these ideas of these corridors, we can create wildlife corridors. We can all sort of have our faces towards wildlife, um, give them a little more space and um, ability to move through the landscape, uh, ensuring that they stay on the landscape for the long term, which I think is great. And again, all of these efforts are bringing us towards this larger connectivity plan so that we can all help the uh, connect the Catskills to the Adirondacks for the future. Now maybe, you know, I don't know, we're not gonna make it look like 1862, or just not. But there are things that we can do to make it better for wildlife to, to cross. And um, we're gonna try to do that um, through great partnerships and good conservation work. So please take a look um, at our website, mohawkhudson.org. You can learn more about this project. You can check out our um, newsletter, our upcoming events, and again, um, that checklist for the Preserve Challenge so you can get outside and enjoy some winter weather. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. So I'd like to open up to questions, um, put it in the chat. Um, thank you, Sarah. This was super interesting and really cool. Um, I'm a big fan of wildlife uh, capture videos and things like that. So um, really neat to see. And um, yeah, if you have any questions for Sarah or about the art, I'd be happy to answer them. Sarah can answer her questions because obviously she's the expert there. Uh, we have someone asking, where is a good place to stand to view the noses? Can you suggest to us a good spot for that? It is very difficult because of the traffic, um, but there is that really nice rest station. Um, <laughs> That, that has the Erie Canal sign on it. Yes. Um, I don't know which one that is, but yes, that one is nice. And that would probably be the best viewing for that area, I think. Um, so it's on the, 
I mean, if you're on the freeway going um, west, it'll yeah. obviously be on your right. And yeah. Because it is um, kind of a tough spot. spot. The other spot is the uh, Montgomery Tra County Transfer Station on 5S. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the bike path as well, someone reminded us, um, which is really cool. Um, it travels all along the Mohawk, um, very uh, all along the um, Erie Canal. What data do you collect to determine if um, if the corridor is successful? That is a great question. Um, I think that any work that we do to connect any portion of that large landscape is going to be helpful for wildlife. The big question is, will we ever fully connect the entire corridor? and what that looks like. And we're all still learning what that means. Um, for me, I know we may not ever be able to connect it, but as long as we try and get stepping stones in between to make sure we have a balance between the built and the natural environment, that we'll be making a success. So I don't have a definite answer to that question, but I hope that helps. Uh, this last comment, I, I too was really interested um, in what you were saying about migration and climate change. Um, we think of migrations not necessarily in such a large scale, like we know wildebeest in Africa, you know, we get these like nature programs that give us, but we don't see so much like that really great map you showed us that our animals are moving and they're yeah. moving constantly. And I think that's something that I was really surprised at. Yeah, it's something that's happening. I mean, they predict that the the climate in New York will be the climate like Virginia in a very short time. We're already seeing shifts in ranges of, of birds. You know, for example, some birds don't move as far south as they used to because our winters are more mild. And so these things are already happening now. Um, and things are moving further and further north. It's it's an interesting time. and. A little scary too, <laughs> but um, we're doing the best we can. Um, yeah, I think that this is, you know, we often see climate change as such a huge, terrifying picture. And this says, let's bring it down to what we can do here, but also let's connect it out a little bit more. Like not, not too much, but there is, you know, there's more we can do. Um, which I thought was interesting. Um, I did have a question. This will be on the Arkell um, YouTube and if the Mohawk Hudson Land Conservancy would like it as well um, on their YouTube page or website um, by the end of the week. And um, yeah, that'll be good. Let's see what else we have. Um, someone said um, the UK is using private landowners to create a corridor for hedgehogs. Do you know smaller landowners with backyards to support the corridor? So, this so how, how much land do you have to have for the conservancy to be active in that kind of regard? So I love the example with the UK and hedgehogs. Hedgehogs are these tiny little mammals that are incredibly adorable, tend to be nocturnal, but even just putting a buffer at the back of your small lawn and connecting a bunch of suburban lawns, you can create amazing habitat for a tiny mammal. And it's no different in the cat's skill to add around that corridor or even your own backyard wherever you live. Um, we have a great section on our webpage um, called, I think it's Nature in Your Backyard. And so that, and let me just look it up really quickly. Yep, it's under conserve and called nature in your backyard. And it gives all kinds of great tips and tricks. So no matter how much land, big or small you own, there are things that you can do to help wildlife. And it's not always about land protection. It could be as simple as feeding the birds or putting out a winter bird bath. Um, and so the idea is that we all take part to do a little bit for wildlife and it goes a long way. Um, I love the idea of little hedgehogs, though. That's a great example. <laughs> um, there's some chatter in the chat. 
I'm going to go with that, about uh, rattlesnake populations in the noses. And um, Mark notes that the uh, north side uh, has seen, historically has seen um, active uh, rattlesnake populations, but they're highly endangered. Yes. Um, Mark King's our executive director. He fielded the other question too about if the noses were public um, for walking and they are privately owned. So there's no public access. That's why it's hard to actually go like look at them even from afar. Um, it's all privately owned all through that area. Thanks Mark for fielding those. <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions we can answer for you tonight? Really interesting. I just want to make my, I don't, I live in an apartment, but I'm like, how can I make this help? How can I help? This is great. Is there a tunnel or cave under the river uh, in maybe in that area? Are there culverts in that area? So they're not. Actually, the swimming is the easiest part. Um, I spent a lot of time on the St. Lawrence River and you would be amazed at how well white-tailed deer can swim in really deep water across <laughs> the channels. It's incredible to watch. Um, so really the, the Mohawk River is the easy part. It's getting across the lanes of traffic, um, mm -hmm. the rail system and all the other things. Um, so although there isn't a tunnel or a cave under the river, um, swim's the easy part. So how much work, or I don't know even how to phrase this, but you must connect with DOT. And how is this in the state level um, part of plans for new road construction or modification of road construction? That's a great question. Yeah, so all of this work is being packaged into that connectivity plan. And the data is being shared with DOT and the Thruway Authority. And we're going to provide recommendations to them. Um, there is the recent infrastructure bill that came out and about $350 million of that infrastructure bill has been earmarked for wildlife crossings alone. Oh, wow. um, and so we're hoping some of that money will trickle down and could actually um, help support some of this work. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. All right. Anything else you'd like to add, Sarah? No, I just, I think John Napel asked who owns the land. I don't have the name of the landowner right offhand. I think there's actually two or three landowners that own the face and a few others that own the top. And then there's, you know, some own big nose and some own, no, own little nose. So it's pretty complicated land ownership in there. Um, but that is a great question. And um, they own a little piece of paradise, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of my favorite spots to drive through, um, especially on the north side. It's so beautiful. And Mark just answered the question. So thanks for that, Mark. <laughs> yes, that section where the um, the Mohawk um, are is absolutely stunning to drive by. Um, yeah. And, you know, to talk to, talk to them and, and go there is also great. Um, but what a beautiful spot. Just nestled into this little nook. Um, really, really beautiful. Always pretty when I drive through there. Yeah, and I will note that there is a gift shop um, that the Mohawk, or sorry, the Mohawk people run that is on the north side of the Mohawk River. Um, I don't know if it's open with COVID and stuff, but you should all check it out. It's a great way to support um, our Indigenous people. Yeah, and they're definitely doing work with the land there and improvements and things. So really interesting. I don't know if they've if they've been open, but give them a call. You know, see what's up. Um, Anything else, anyone? Thank you for all the kind comments and for coming out tonight again. Apologies for that Zoom issue. Um, maybe Sarah and I will do this again sometime. We'll have to have to find some other landscapes we can talk about. Um, I think that's great. Yes, Mark says, check out their website. They do many awesome things. There's a therapy walk coming up. We can all use a little therapy and walking. Perfect. And uh, check out the Arkell Museum social media um, and our website. We are updating things daily uh, and it's gonna be a lot of fun this season. So happy 2022. I do wanna give a quick, quick plug to the Arkell Museum. It's one of my favorite spots. I fell in love with it a few years ago. Um, they did a great exhibit just on the animals um, that were part of the collection. 
that um, the Ark Hills have. So it was all just themed with animals, everything from dog portraits to cattle grazing out in the field. And the museum itself is um, just really well done. And really, it feels very special because it's not a huge, huge gallery, but the items that are there are very just well done and it feels incredibly special. So if you get a chance to go for any exhibit, not just the animals, um, you should definitely do it. It's a local gem that really, I don't think enough people know about. Yeah, please spread the word. Um, we have fine art that you wouldn't expect um, in the Mohawk Valley, um, very famous painters. And um, also our portrait show does have a portrait of two grouse because animal portraiture was quite the thing for prize winning animals. So we have one animal painting in our portrait exhibition. Um, but New York State Grange photography portraits and um, that is what's coming up for the spring. So we'll let you all go. Thank you so much for being here and check out our websites for more fun things happening. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Mary. Thank Take care.